Welcome to the Church of Mavis live. Tonight's guest is Wayne Herschel. We're going to be talking about stargates and star maps in his book, The Hidden Records. Definitely had to do some research to catch up with Wayne. Certain things like the star map of the, the Hebrew key of Solomon parchment, the star map of the Freemason first degree tracing board, uh, star map of the Vatican City. He definitely gets into some pretty deep subjects. We've never had a guest to really get into these types of subjects, but it revolves all around alien life and civilizations being, um, you know, influencing the Earth on some yeah, level. It's, it's the whole ancient astronauts uh, thing. This is, what yeah, Cal, this is what me and Cal Korf originally got in a fight over. This whole thing started with me and Cal Korf over Wayne Herschel. Really? Yeah. Yep. So, yeah. I didn't know it had anything to do with Wayne Herschel, but I definitely saw you two fighting. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, he, he said that his little show in Europe, uh, they did that little special about Europe or whatever. Well, I demanded that from him, and he's yet to produce it. So, you may be right. <laughs> there's, no sh there's no show. There's no show. Yeah. yeah. Because we actually debated putting Guy Weddle and Kyle Korf on uh, a debate of sorts. Who and cares? I, I told Kyle that he has to produce the evidence of the show, the TV show that he claims that Guy is on, and he's yet to do it. So, But anyway, please, let's get to another subject besides Kyle Korf, please, before I shoot myself. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I had to stop and be nice to him because he – wrote on my wall to wish me happy birthday, and I was like, oh, now I can't go yell at him. <laughs> yeah, you still can. It's okay. <laughs> I know. I, I got a little, let a little time pass, and, uh, you know. I just, I, I, I know that a lot of people don't like Cal Corf, and I talk to him sometimes, but it's kind of like I told you. It's kind of like I'm a, a mad scientist, and I'm, like, wondering why he's so despised, so I just kind of, like, observe him all the time. <laughs> and then I'm all the time getting letters warning me about him, like, in my inbox. Dude, <laughs> he's, he's on the UFO watch talk list. He's he a is. stalker. He's done he prison is. time. <laughs> he's delusional. <laughs> he's but, uh, dude, he's completely delusional. Yeah, I know. I don't, that's why it's probably not a good idea to get him debating you on the radio. I don't want <laughs> hey man, nice shot, you know, the filter song situation where the anchor man like shoots himself live on air or something to that effect. I mean, he, he went, he, he went absolutely nuts. I mean, I'm surprised he's not crawling around in my yard right now. You know, that he, I just said he was, you know, full of you know what and well, you how know, dare really, you, uh, I'm going to. I'm going to expose him. When we interviewed David Biedney, we found out, I found out a lot more about him. Apparently, he had stopped David Biedney on some level, and it got really weird. And I think yeah. there were some kind of restraining orders. I don't know about that, but uh, he made a YouTube video about David, and it's hilarious. <laughs> it's hilarious, man. I'll have to see it sometime. Okay. Yeah, okay. Uh Basically, uh, Wayne Herschel's Live from Africa. Can you sing that song again, please, Guy, like you did a minute ago? No, I'm not singing that song. I don't even know the words. It's that Toto song. Way out in Africa, something like that. But, yeah, it's like 5 a.m. in the morning there, so we're going to uh, talk to him about his book, The Hidden Records. And there's also something that's really been making a lot of uh, airtime on the CNN side that he's involved with that has something to do with the ancient papyrus, the ancient papyrus of raw. You know, we're going to talk to him about that as well. Oh, oh, wing, yeah. I thought you were talking about cow. I was like, what are you talking yeah, about? Please. <laughs> cow. He's a zit on the birth of Horus. <laughs> yeah. But now we're going to talk about raw and some ancient papyrus depicting him doing something in a UFO or something to that effect. Yeah, that's all. That's pretty good. I love it. But well, basically, uh, I guess we're ready to call him, right? Yeah, I'll give him a call. Yeah. I'm ready to rock and roll. I'm recovering from my long week of algebra trying to kill me, and I survived, and here I am. So that's rock and roll. Uh, Jeff 
Jeffrey, uh, Pritchard, and Guy Weddle from the Church of Mavis. How are you? Good in yourself. We're, we're recording, so yeah. we're broadcasting your frequency. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, basically, let's start the questions. And uh, my first question for you, Wayne, is your book, The Hidden Records. I would like to know what drove you to create such a book and also after you tell us that tell us you know exactly what the book is about so the audience knows and everything you could please sure yeah sure Jeff um, I had two amazing uh, experiences in my life that, that uh, set me off in, in complete different directions to an average researcher mainly because you know when, when someone has seen something in the sky that is in the papers the next day and you know it's not an aircraft, it's not anything explainable, it can only be something not of this world. Um, your, your experience alone shows that you should go in a certain direction if you're looking for evidence of it in, in history, for example. Um, having that as a base, as well as uh, a near-death experience uh, where you feel like your soul is out of the body, um, and remembering such in, in sort of intricate details, um, so having those two amazing changes in your life, and the, the quest to find out more, um, you're kind of biased. You, you know that it's real. You don't have to prove anything. You just have to look for it in history, and, and it started like that. And the yeah, content and, uh, of the book, yeah, as far yeah. as how did you uh, come about, like as far as star map locations and yeah. noticing things of possible extraterrestrial origin in different civilizations, what... What what gave you that hint that in that direction with the book? Yeah, uh, that that is the the near death experience. You know, people speak of walking into the light and uh, going along a tunnel and then being sent back to your body and being told the time is not right. I believe I came back with a lot more than I left with. I believe that uh, I had a chance to interact with what was at the end of the tunnel, and it's the proverbial God experience. Call it what you like, but it's like this cosmic tree of light and um, I had an experience there that when I came back when they resuscitated me um, I was in a motorcycle accident in, in a uh, cross country motocross race and um, they thought that I had a bad knock on the head because I was I was a bit delirious and, and excited and trying to explain what I just experienced and uh, my brother sort of uh, followed a bit of what I was saying and um, I remember telling the story rather than remembering the event. This is the weirdest thing. It's like, how do you remember a dream sometimes? You remember telling or, or thinking of it through your mind in, in, in pieces, and um, you hardly remember it much later on. But that's what I really remembered. All the things that I was saying, I, uh, I went out and researched, and um, I was seeing star maps, star maps of who we are and where we come from. I think this is the question that I asked at the uh, Cosmic Tree or the God Experience, and... Um, I just had to go uh, and, and search for these star maps, and um, which, believe it, they're everywhere. So you saw these. Uh, how did you see them? Did you see them like uh, when you were out? Did you just see like the pyramids and stuff like that, and like these other sites, and it just all coincided yeah, together? This, yeah, this had to um, explain it. It's like seeing an overlay. You see the layout of pyramids, and then you see a tree, and you see stars, and then you see um, all the different places, you know, Angkor Wat in, in, in Cambodia. You see um, the pyramids, not just of Egypt, but of the, the Maya. There's, there's so many different ancient sites. So so I had this answer to um, who we are, where we come from physically, and there was a second aspect as well, because, there's this, you know, spiritually, I'm, I'm in the spirit. You know, where do we come from spiritually? And it was this place, this, this weird nucleus of the universe, and um, what was its purpose? How, how, does it, how does it work? And um, that goes off in a complete different direction. Obviously, you know, the, the spiritual story, which I've, I've made an internet site for. But my whole book, The Hidden Records, is on, on these ancient star maps around the world, taking it from the angle of just a researcher, looking at patterns, looking at repeating patterns, and, and astronomers have checked them. And uh, as today, they, um, they can't refute them as being improbable. No, they can't. I mean, there's just too much uh, coincidence with everything. Um, first thing I saw with you was your uh, YouTube uh, thing you made about Ra. Can you go into that a little bit, about that whole... Uh... <clears throat> sure. 
Um, the Egyptian story is based on the, uh, the, the beginnings. They call it Seb Zepi, the how did Egypt start? Um, it's uh, these gods that came from the sky. They came down in a celestial ship. All very well, but you know, where's the documentation of it? Is it some crazy religion where they um, they just dreamed all this stuff up? And if if it was, why on earth did the Sumerians have the same crazy obsession, crazy lying, if you can call it that? I mean, why would people just lie about all this stuff? And of course, um, there's a lot of stuff missing, and this is why I call the book the Hidden Records because all the best pieces that I've found were obscure um, libraries or obscure museum collections or things like that that were not made public in many instances. So um, having put all the, 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 the raw story together, I could see that um, there was a, uh, a tomb. It's all based around a tomb in Egypt that is not really a public visiting place. It's a very obscure tomb that's got a whole lot of trash piled up in front of it. And um, this tomb shows the star of Ra, which is a sun, but it's not our sun. And that's that's the primary thing about this story of the beginnings of Egypt with this so-called sun god, solar star god. It wasn't our sun at all. And then that's quite a big thing that needs to be rectified in, in, in all the beginnings of ancient civilization. Yes, they had an obsession with a sun, but it's not ours. So, have you, how, do we know, how do you know that it's not our sun? Okay, in, in the Egyptian tomb, for example, they showed us a tiny little red dot with a, a circle around the edge. It's the primary focus of uh, Dan Brown's last book that he just wrote called The Lost Symbol. It is this symbol that is, its meaning has been lost. Dan Brown is completely onto the story. He knows that, that the meaning is completely lost. And in this depiction, it has um, the constellation of, they call it the leg of the bull. It was a weird little grouping of stars that made the shape of a bull's leg. Now, bull's leg is part of Taurus. Scholars need to re-look at that interpretation because tradition has it that it's a different star constellation. And uh, on a coffin lid in, uh, in one of the American museums, it shows all the stars are filled in. And, and you can't see stars and our sun together. So this is a scene of the night. And from this tomb, it shows that little red dot and a little circle around it is a beam of light coming down onto Earth and the complete collection of gods standing on the Earth with a narrator pointing up to this little star. It can only be interpreted one way, and that's the star Earth. So looking at all your uh, information that you have here, I'm, I'm wondering how, how much trouble have you had um, getting in with uh, mainstream science to, to reevaluate some of these, you know, things. Because it's, it's kind of like, you know, they have a, a lot of just pieces of history, and then, you know, these guys just fill in all the blanks, and then once they fill in all the blanks, it becomes law, you know what I mean? So how do you, how do you get science to go back and look at this stuff again? <laughs> now, when you start speaking of aliens, there seems to be red flags that go up everywhere, <laughs> and it's... <laughs> And I, I think I've understood the, the, the whole process now. And it, it started off in the beginning being just frustration, and I thought they were just stupid. But there is a huge global anti, um, let's call it a, a cover-up of the paranormal, a cover-up of ancient evidence of the UFOs. There should be a lot of this stuff. And I bet you there was, and I bet you that the, the elite of our ages past, going centuries back right to even the Christ era, they were covering up all these discs and all this, this information, it was only for the elite few in groups in different countries that were allowed to know the reality of it because there's one huge problem with it. It was selling the idea. These visitors that came from above were selling the idea that humanity is destructive, barbaric, and needs to change its ways. Now, if you're in any country in the world that needs to go rape, plunder, and, and, and uh, steal from your, your neighboring countries for the old way, which is conquering. The word conquer is a very acceptable way of life to go and take and enslave people and take their, their riches. That was the way it used to be. And you know what? I think it's coming back. I think this sort of thing is, is, is re... Uh, what can you say? Redeveloping? Um, <laughs> yeah, man. It, it's, of, it's never stopped, yeah. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's sold It's sold as, as terrorism, war, and um, hidden... Uh, I want to say politics, but more like... Um, the business system, let's call it the, the capital 
business plan. If you see the laws in capital business that allow certain countries to do this and the next thing, you start wondering, you know, who's behind all this? It seems that the richest people in the world are all behind this, and they need to get richer, and we need to be enslaved. The average Joe average needs to be enslaved working full day uh, hours and very little reward. Now, to me, that's slavery. You know, what did a slave have in the past? He still had food, shelter, and whatever, and he worked his butt off. And I think this is which way we, you know, this is the, the, our future. This sounds uh, quite a threat to humanity. So, <clears throat> what do you think the overall purpose of the Stonehenge and the surrounding mounds and the Egyptian pyramids were they? Uh, were they shrines? The, the amazing thing is nobody's ever really looked at the patterns from above. If you take stones, for example, um, sure, there's a big stone circle, and people uh, think, well, that's all there is when you go and visit. You know, what else is there? If you look across from Stonehenge in two different directions, you will see there's a greater plan. There's other mounds. Call them um, conical pyramids, because a pyramid really is just a man-made mound. Some are more geometric and some are round. You know, some of just just big, uh, what do you call them, just dumps of earth, you know, earth dumps that seem to be positioned so something could be marked, something could be uh, attained going inside them as well. Yes, there's some kind of a spiritual thing that happens inside tombs of, of these man-made mounds. But if you look at them from the, from, from the sky, you'll see there's a pattern of the most important monument in any civilization. So look at the most important monument and look at what's near it. All of them seem to have this little group of seven near it or a pattern that, that marks other star systems around where the position of this unique sun-like star is found in the sky. And uh, they are showing the exit marks the spot. I think this is the whole layout plan, but that's only one half of the story. It's what goes on inside them is a spiritual thing, and um, people think it's a place to bury a dead king. I think it's a place for an initiate to experience an out-of-body experience, and this is what's so weird. Um, it, it's for the living. It's definitely not a place for the dead. You know, the Romans, uh, after they conquered Egypt, you know, when they were, they disassembled a lot of things to, like, build roads and uh, stuff like that and buildings. Um, have you taken any of that into consideration? Or, like, were they, you know, is there stuff missing that was actually there before? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. In Egypt especially, the 50 pyramids of Lower Egypt um, look like they're in post-apocalyptic uh, ruin. The most important part in the area that was Memphis, there was a group of seven pyramids of, and an obelisk. You know, an obelisk, I wouldn't say like a George Washington monument, but it's about a third of the size. And, and it was an obelisk. And the, the amazing thing was that part was t taken apart first, perhaps because um, it's... Uh, they didn't, it was a new area. Remember, there were different different empires. And I think a lot of these empires challenged the previous one and uh, found that their pyramids and, and their area was a nice supply to build temples, and they just take the blocks of the pyramids. And they did this to the whole of the Egyptian pyramid field, including Giza. They would all be perfectly flat-sided monuments and maybe a little bit of weathering on the outside. Because remember, it was a desert for the last 9,000 years, so... Uh, you don't, you don't get much weathering uh, on a pyramid, so they should all be standing as a perfect monument. But of course, there were missing pyramids. In fact, complete disassemblance of pyramids. And I think in Giza, there's, there's four of them that are completely taken away. Yeah, I know there was a pyramid. There's a mountain or, or a hill um, that's above the, uh, the, you know, the three big pyramids now, the popular ones, and. Mm -hmm. It was completely, um, it was completely 100% dismantled to make roads. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Oh. I don't know if it was the roads. You know, I, I would take it back even further because this seems to have uh, taken place uh, even thousands of years ago. I think the Egyptians themselves, through the change of empires, um, started taking bits and pieces apart. And if you look at some of the temples alone, the, the stone matching. Um, a geologist, I think, uh, stated some time ago that some of the blocks uh, to build some of the temples were from other temples and perhaps even the pyramids themselves. But definitely, up until 80 years ago, um, all these ancient monuments, if they've got blocks on the outside, are a very nice source to build whatever they want. So uh, 
I guess it's, I'm going to get into this now. <laughs> so, uh, Wayne, I'm kind of curious, as I sit back and I think about ancient civilizations and the extraterrestrials who are the advanced beings who are creating them on some level, I kind of sit back and try to look at it spiritually as well. I'm kind of wondering as far as, well, let's say you're an advanced alien being and you see the earth and it comes in and I guess I could imagine it having maybe souls or spirits and, you know, building these structures and then somehow mankind is introduced within this. It almost seems like they're building a blueprint of sorts on some level, but I can also see with the differences like the Egyptians, the Mayans, I mean, are they different cultures from space? I'm trying to figure out more of the, the agenda of the, the the advanced beings on some level, if you could help with that. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, the earliest records all have a commonality, not just for building pyramids, but the way that the so-called visitors from the sky look. They, they all seem to have weird animal heads, um, the most common being the bird head, the bird-headed god. And um, if you look at some of the Mayan pictures, it actually goes right back to their earliest depictions. They actually show the very well um, artistically drawn detail of the bird head. And there's a breathing device, there's a backpack um, and oxygen um, tubes and all these sort of things. And even, even headphones and microphones. And you won't believe the kind of detail in the Mayan depictions. I'm thinking the whole bird-headed god is simply a helmet, a helmeted deity, a person. I, I shouldn't really use the word deity. These are flesh and blood visitors. Sure, they worship them over the ages to follow. But um, I think they were, uh, all the ancient cultures were visited over and over again each time they became destructive. So these folks that came from the sky would look at us and think, goodness, correct. Look at these guys shooting and killing. Okay, they were using spears and whatever, you know, murdering their neighbors and, you know, to try and create peace, um, tranquility and, and morality. It probably uh, tried to come and teach all different places around the world about the, the importance of the, the spiritual event inside the pyramid because once they learn that they'll naturally follow because they know how the universe works they have the ability to to see the rest of the universe spiritually um, they I think the teachers up until the time of the Christ were visiting and visiting over and over again and it actually was being twisted and the powers that be were so so after uh, raping pillaging and plundering that these these texts were hidden, and uh, it seems to have gone all the way along to a, a protocol even in life today where the paranormal events need to be hidden. I even go as far as saying that I think that our powers that be, call them the elite, call them whoever you like, it's a global network of people that do not think it's in their best interest if anything of this nature is revealed today. If they could for example, reveal or allow a UFO event to occur and be filmed and simply let them go again, the first thing I guarantee the words that come out of these visitors' mouths is, you people are deceiving your populations. You people are treating your fellow brothers, your other human beings, uh, incorrectly. You've put a price on learning and knowledge. How can you, you know, do such a terrible thing? I think it would take a huge lecture, and um, I think I know that that will happen. And uh, it's completely not in the interest of profiteering on a grand scale. If you take the 400 richest people in the world and look at the Forbes list and look at what happened over the last two years when the rest of the economy and the rest of Joe Average has lost and had lower income and actually suffered, they all got richer. Now, you must just ask yourself that. How on earth does that happen? And, and who's behind it? And, and uh, what would another ancient... So what would a very advanced civilization think, visiting our world, seeing what is happening? Two billion starving people. I mean, you just can't figure it. Yeah, dude, that's just our, you know, I, I, I seem to say this every single episode, but, you know, that's just, <laughs> that's just what we are. I mean, that's our, that's our nature. It's been since, since we uh, probably came out of the goo and became sentient, we've, we've acted that way, you know? Yeah, um, evil. <laughs> I mean, I mean, listen. 
look at what happened with the oil spill. You have this oil spill, yeah. and everybody in the country is just really mean and upset about it. And look yeah. what conveniently didn't happen over the summer. The gas prices didn't go up. Uh-huh. When last year, you know, they went up like, you know, a dollar. Mm-hmm. A couple years before that, it was like $4. Yeah. Are you saying that you, you believe as well there's some kind of orchestration behind all these, um, let's call them accidents? I don't know. I, 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 no. Just looking from the outside, I, there's so many weird things that happened with that oil thing. I mean, it's, to me, it just looks obvious. And to a lot of people that are conspiracy theorists, you know, you just Google the stuff. I mean, the, you know, <laughs> when no, the I guy think... goes and buys up a cleanup, a cleanup uh, operation before a couple of days before the event, I mean... It was a PR yeah. move. That's all it is. It's a... You know, yeah. the, the, the well blew up. People weren't doing their job or whatever. You know, they were cutting corners. It blew up. People died. You know, and we had this huge accident. And the oil companies are like, well, we can't raise the prices now because they're really going to hate us. You know, they hate us now. They think we're all this stuff. And now, you know, it's just that's just way people are. They're just, they're just out to make money. I thought there was something else taking place here, but maybe I'm wrong. It, uh, to me, it looked like um, the uh, oil folk had bought the, um, the patent for the most efficient battery, and they were probably showing that oil was, you know, it's time for a change. Um, we've got this car battery thing now, and we can make electric cars. I, I actually started thinking that it was something orchestrated to bring in the electric car in a very profitable way. It's all profit, isn't it? Oh, yeah, that's, that's, that's all it's about, period. It. Yeah. That's why all these news places, you know, CNN, MSNBC, all these things, they don't actually really report the news. I mean, it's all just fluff because that's what that's what people want to hear because they can't constantly process all this heavy duty stuff. So they'll have a few words on Pakistan and then an hour on Lindsay Lohan. You know. <laughs> Really? So, uh, so, so Wayne, uh, yes. one thing that I'm uh, wondering, since you've studied so many ancient civilizations and like their hieroglyphics and things to that nature, how many of them depict a time of change in the future that maybe could be equated to 2012? Like, I know we had the whole Mayan calendar thing that supposedly ran out because of whatever and whatever. But are there any other civilizations out there who possibly are depicting some strange thing that could happen during our time? Uh, out of all of them, only the Mayan calendar is one that is, of a pyramid or megalithic civilization that had uh, a definite prophecy or an, at an end time or a time uh, mark that uh, didn't, didn't matter after that. But um, if you're speaking of other things that have followed in history, um, you'd have to include uh, a couple of uh, prophecies, for example, the Nostradamus prophecies, the Revelations prophecy. Um, put all those together and study them in, in, in very great detail as to what they say happened. When um, when things look like they do now, when there's uh, floods, famine, um, earthquakes, a whole lot of things that are all patterns that have been mentioned, um, they seem to depict um, a very clear scenario of a mountain falling from the sky. In Revelations, they called it Wormwood. In Nostradamus, it was a bearded star that falls. And um, I think if there is a probability, it is it is going to be around about the date uh, of 2012. I wouldn't say it's on one exact day. I think it's just a generality comparison to a galactic measurement just because that is close to the event. So um, it, but <laughs> I have a complete different thought. So I'm going to tell you that uh, is my own experience, having that near-death experience, realizing that our world is in such great turmoil and there's so much human suffering. The creation is connected to every human soul and if we are over 2 billion, let's say now there's 3 billion soul suffering, the creation will, will not allow it to go on. And, um, and, and the natural event occurs. It's just a balance of nature. And the weirdest thing is for the last 10,000 years, it appears our world has been protected by advanced entities that think we have a hope. There's a lot of lives here, and they've been deflecting all the impact. If you look at the moon, look at Mars, look at Venus, they're all Swiss cheese. 
what the heck happened to us for the last 10,000 years? Our scientists are even blasé and say, oh, well, we just, you know, these things are rare, you know, once every 100,000 years maybe. These things should be falling every 100 to 200 years and in a big way. And I think we won't be protected anymore. There won't be any kind of need to protect likely because it's like an animal that's suffering. What do you do when your favorite loved pet is, is suffering with, with a terminal situation? You put it down. And as, as hard as it is to say this, I think we've reached a point where we need to, you know, just see where we stand. And if we're not helping fellow human beings, um, terrible natural events are going to occur, and it's close. Do you think, for instance, I believe also, of course, that there are beings who are caretakers of the earth, and I think it ties in some way with some of the light being experiences I've had, and I think there's a definitely a group of extraterrestrials, creators who were involved in the creation of this planet who protect us from some level. But as far as you studying some of these ancient civilizations, for instance, let's say the Egyptians, uh, I'm curious to like their mythologies and how that connects or does it to the extraterrestrials. And another thing that I wonder is, for instance, you have the Egyptian, you know, belief system. I have the Book of the Dead. Very strange. I've never yeah. gotten through the whole thing, but it's definitely a strange book. <laughs> but when they depict some of these beings of evil, like, for instance, yeah. Set, I don't know if any of this is considered evil. He's definitely spooky, but Set, for sure. Are these yeah. mythological archetypes, is there any proof that they're based on actual extraterrestrials, or is it just mankind trying to grasp them in their own perception, in their own way. I think it's pretty clear in the Egyptian stories. The Book of the Dead um, is, is quite an amazing book. And you know what? The, um, the real Egyptian translation of the dead is of the spirit. And it doesn't have to be a dead person to be reading those in, in, in uh, incantations and uh, utterances. Most of them speak of of in the spirit world, and, and obviously for us, then the person must be dead, as an average human would interpret. But I think it's uh, a bit of a misnomer. If you look at the Book of the Dead and read, for example, um, one of them that has been, that's actually been rewritten, and um, its original source was in the Urnus Pyramid, um, the King's Journey through the Cosmos. He was a, a, a spirit. But then there's a huge part of it that says he was re uh, brought back to back to his body again. But you know what? The the, um, the the stories of the Egyptians and the Sumerians run very parallel. And although although they're separate, they do speak of these ships that fly and that they were uh, evil entities as well. They were evil as far as that they were powerful, destructive, and uh, wanted to enslave people, for example. But um, I'm afraid the only way to, to in, interpret these sort of things is that maybe they didn't just make this all up as a, a weird belief system. I think they're real records of an advanced era, long before when there was uh, more destructive visitations, but the majority seem to have been the more positive visits, where they were teachers and uh, trying to guide humanity. Yeah, well, India had the same, you know, that... They have the same type of stories. I mean, they have a whole religion pretty much based on that. Hinduism, yeah. What about uh, what about Christ and Horus? I've, I've heard a lot about this. Um, they, they have very similar creation stories, don't they? You know, the, um, there's a whole story of, uh, let's say, Horus the Egyptian um, is, is a human flesh and blood being um, the, the good story the, the, how he um, uh, more the link with Osiris and, and, and speaking of, of good things for the earth and people and whatever and if we take the Christ story I, I think the most um, confused issue about the Christ story is um, that he was God or would it be so bad if the creation could speak through him in other words like a medium to me, it still makes him godlike, and uh, the words that he spoke were the words of God in that sense. But if, what if he was just basically another flesh and blood being, his father, most likely a genetic uh, entity not of this earth? I mean, the whole Mary being impregnated story. I, I'm sorry, science to me is, is the laws of the universe. You know, you need the, the male sperm, you need the female egg, and I'm pretty sure Mary 
had those things for the special soul that was going to inhabit this uh, this Messiah, this message bringer's um, future. Perhaps the soul had chosen, the Christ soul had chosen to do some good in this earth. And uh, these are real people. Flesh and blood involved with real visitation, the, the whole story of angels. Um, what else can you say? Brightly clad beings that could fly, that came from the heavens. Um, these are aliens, you know. We use that word in, in our English dictionary to describe the same thing. I think these are just real stories of advanced things that have happened. And and I think today's cover-up, um, they're afraid to come and visit because they know they'll be shut down. They know that uh, we will arrest them and we wouldn't let them go. Definitely. I do believe when it comes to these ancient cultures and religions and beliefs, and uh, I kind of picture it like this spiritually. There's one source which would be God, the Great Spirit, or whatever you want to call it. And basically, these cultures and religions are guided by this divine force, and basically, you know, all these things they build are kind of like a blueprint towards it to kind of align with it in their own ways, because it's strange how different pantheons of, like, uh, gods, like, you know, they're very similar to other religions, and they kind of have the same motive. So it's kind of like they're all talking about the same dude, but it's just like a different set of them. Like, for instance, I think there's a Christ energy, and it'll come in, and, you know, perhaps it did come in as Jesus Christ, yes. But I'm sure there are other teachers as well that this divine, kind of like uh, Luke Skywalker, you know. <laughs> it comes in, and it takes different forms as different yeah. teachers. And I do believe that energy is connected to the beings who protect this planet, you know, the ones we're speaking of, the caretakers and all that. But let's get back on to uh, the star maps again to kind of steer us in that direction uh, of your book, The Hidden Record. Um, these star maps, what is the point of the star maps? What exactly are they for? Why do you call them star maps? Yeah. This is it. If, if we had visitors from the past, or even better than that, what if our ancestors had landed here um, right in the beginning, wanted to obviously build these pyramids because of the internal uh, value of, of inside a man-made mountain as a spiritual induction device that takes the soul out of its body and can travel the cosmos and come back again. They would want to lay it out, showing the pattern of the stars, most likely where they came from. What did the Americans do when they landed on the moon? put it in the flag. That was a grand event to show this is who we are. We did it. We've, we've arrived. Um, if, if it was important to know where, for example, uh, we, our ancestors came from, and it was a message that needed to be on this planet to show colonization, a message that is so massive and so big that anywhere in the nearby galaxy with a really strong telescope, you can look down on this planet and see those patterns and uh, any advanced intelligence will be able to see the star patterns near that area or in this part of the galaxy are these star patterns. That's what it would look like from viewing it in that area. They would be able to decipher, well, this is the human code. It's got human faces. There's human bodies. There's, there's, there's encoded detail in these pyramids, and that's a huge part of my book. The, um, the part of the human geometry that is portrayed in these star maps it's showing the message as well. So the message of all these pyramid civilizations around the world isn't really for us. It was actually so massive, and it's, it's pointing heavenwards. It's actually showing the rest of the cosmos who is on this planet. And uh, there were people that were uh, colonists and uh, stuff that we've been uh, deprived of uh, remembering today because of the way the elite have hidden everything. So how did all this information uh, with these star maps get get passed down because we have you know we have the the, the tombs and the uh, Mayan pyramids and the uh, pyramids of Egypt but we also have the uh, uh, first degree tracing board of the Masons, the Vatican City layout, Washington DC layout how is this how was this information moved forward from generation to generation I think so it was the, the, the elite, I've always used the word the elite, the people of, of high, the kingships of past um, they thought that this information, although it shows wonderful things, they didn't think it was fit for the public because they were recruiting armies. They were wanting people to come and fight neighbors of other countries and call them destructive and not chosen people. They, they pillaged and, and, and 
twisted these stories. So what we were getting as religion from all different civilizations was what they thought the public need to know to make them good war fighters. And uh, it's, it's quite sad to think that um, you know they've, they've, they've manipulated in that way and kept all the good stuff for themselves. But these star maps are, in some tradition, not just the, mon- the uh, megalithic layouts, they were also on artifacts. And as you say, the first degree tracing board. Having seen all these patterns right in the beginning and having found the megalithic civilizations who were repeating it, then I wanted to look at what happened after the Christ story. Does the Christ story uh, involve the star map? It does. And I'll, we can talk about that in a minute. It goes all the way through to, uh, to the tracing board of the Freemasons. And remember, Hiram Abiff was the, um, the story of the beginning of Freemasonry. He had the secret, a man called Hiram Abiff, and he was murdered for his secret. What was his secret? And you know, this is the, the foundation of the, uh, the Freemasons. And isn't it weird that the first degree out of 33 degrees is this tracing board? And if you look at the original one in the uh, Bradford University, the historical version, it's very different now to all those that have evolved. There's been a lot since the time of George Washington that all seems very different. I like to look at the beginnings of the story. And the amazing thing is with the first degree tracing board, it shows the solar trinity in the sky, the same star map found in the Egyptian tomb, the same beam of light coming down from it, and the pillars on the ground are the markers. They're the markers of what is in the sky, and it's three pillars on the ground. And you do the map. <laughs> what are the odds? And uh, look at the star patterns. Look at the whole layout of that tracing board. It is really a, an amazing, beautiful star map. So you think maybe they could have just saw it and took it? <laughs> I think it was. <laughs> you know, hey, that's pretty still, cool. Let's use that as our. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's two ways to look at this. You know, is it something they've always known? I don't think so, because I've got two Freemason advisors. Because my my ancient star maps that I had presented in my book called The Hidden Records, um, I had these visits by uh, Freemasons that were saying, that, "Do you realize that your book is actually repeating something uh, that we?" we value as being um, mysterious and important in the beginnings of our tradition. And um, if you look at the first degree tracing board online, because the Bradford University actually made it available online, um, that it's the same thing. And I agree. I said, you know, but how, how do I write about the Freemasons and say that they've known this all the time? Because they were saying, no, we've forgotten the meaning. We don't know the star. What is that star that's blazing? What is the blazing star? And a lot of Freemasons have always said, well, we follow Orion, the three kings, um, like the crash story that, that followed from the east to find the Bethlehem star, blazing star, whatever you want to call it. And um, this is probably serious. Now, that's the wrong direction. That's not going into the area of Taurus. It's, it's not the right star. So I'm doing this very carefully and very respectfully. I'm just saying, look at the old tradition. It's something that's been forgotten. And it's something that's human uplifting. So let's relook at it. That's, that's really all I'm saying. Well, well, are you there? <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. Do you think it's a bad thing? Do you think it's, it's something? Um, I mean, I'm, I've been trying to get different uh, feedback from different people, and um, is it such a bad thing if these things are real that we're not alone in the universe? That the Christ Himself was a human being and spoke to extraterrestrials. What if He returns one day riding the cloud, but? Oh gosh! Inside that cloud is a disc that he's standing on. You know, are we going to shoot him down? Uh, <laughs> all these probably. Uh, I think. I don't want to look at it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The same. Pe- uh, the same people that are running around. You know. You know. Right now, with the Christian right and everything. Right now, these are the same people that, if he came back and started, uh, you know, just doing his teachings and everything, he'd be labeled. Uh, you know, liberal hippies, you know, psycho, and uh, they'd have been the same ones that would have crucified him. Yeah, yeah. I'm well, to me, it's so blatantly right. obvious that these beings, these divine beings we keep talking about, are all involved in every orchestration of religious truth in the scripture, supposedly about things that have happened. They're behind all of it. I mean, it, it's so mm-hmm. evident. I don't understand why so many people have a hard time grasping it as far as, I mean, around some people, uh, Christians, 
you can mention the UFO thing, and, you know, it's Satan flying around in a disc. Not all Christians, of course, but some I've ran into. I live in the South, and they're definitely here, let me assure you. You don't mention UFOs to certain people, or they're like, they'll freak out. And yeah, uh, one important thing is really one important thing you guys can challenge any Christian, and I do it with the greatest of respect, and I've had wonderful reactions even doing it, because it is the truth is all that counts ask any Christian to pick up a Bible that was printed over a hundred years ago. There are old versions available in many libraries, and it's just simply the old King James original um, that was printed more than a hundred years ago. You go to the Ezekiel story, the story of the wheel, the kind of wheel flying, and I'll tell you what, there's one huge human hand intervention with that over the last, I think the last 80 years, where they changed it. They changed all the new versions to a wheel intersecting a wheel. The original version was a wheel in a wheel, but both on their sides. It's a wheel turning in a wheel, and both of them are on their sides. I'm sorry, folks, but that is a flying disc. It's a wheel-like thing. It had eyes all around the edge of the rim. Eyes all around the edge of the rim. That's, those are the typical portals on a UFO. It had barrel crystal as a firmament stretched forth over the head of the occupant in the wheel. Uh, bubble, dome, you know. And then, of course, it produces a cloud, and uh, it wasn't hot. It was no fire. It had something beneath it like fire, but it was cold. Oh, gee, you know, could they be more descriptive? And, and that is a UFO. And I think any Christian that has seen the old Bible has come back to me and said, you know, this isn't a bad thing. You know, I can see that there's something important here, but it's obviously human hand has, has changed the text. And that's the sad part about all of religion. It's been passed down to people that wanted to have war and wanted soldiers and you can't have be peaceful my children make friends with your neighbors and that kind of stuff was taken out <laughs> you have to be the chosen ones and the chosen ones are just one country and every other country is not chosen and go and kill the shit out of them sorry I, I, you know, it's a terrible thing and uh, we're doing it today yeah like uh, if you're in like kindergarten class or something like that I mean they don't they don't, like, teach the whole Bible. They have a few stories that they teach, you know, the real popular stuff, and that's what you learn growing up. I mean, that's what they teach you. They don't, you know, they don't go into, like, um, you know, Ezekiel's will and some of the other stuff that you're talking about. You know, a lot of people think the that there was an object that actually led the Jews out of Egypt and, like, went with them for 40 years in the desert. Well, kept them, kept yeah, them. It's like the Moses story, read exactly, the, go back to the old versions. The older the version, the more detail you're going to get. It was a pillar of light that they followed at night. I mean, a pillar of light coming from the sky. Put it in a situation today, and there's a big pillar of light coming in down from the sky. You know, you're going to say this is a paranormal UFO event. And remember, the um, whatever it was landed at night. God um, was down, in, uh, landed, came down to earth in a tent that had no roof on it. This thing landed. It was the typical Ezekiel wheel. And, yeah, and, um, they, the and they... The occupants they, were cherubim. <laughs> I mean, what did yeah, and they, and they supposedly, like, like, it, like, blocked out the sun as they were, you know, traveling through the desert. It was huge. Okay. And, it, like, you know, and they, like, walked in its shadow. Hmm. And that's crazy. It's, it's just part of the story. Sorry, I, we, we have a bit of a time delay. I keep talking over you. There's another amazing part of the story, and um, I've got to mention it because it's burning inside me, the, um, the Hebrew story. I mean, we've got the Bible that has half Hebrew and half uh, the uh, the Christ story. So uh, what did the Hebrews have to say about all these star maps and that? There is one star map in the ancient Hebrew tradition. It, it's uh, the basis of the icon, the star of David, which is a star, remember? And, of course, the menorah, uh, the seven celestial lights that are celebrated in the homes of all the original Hebrews. They had the menorah, seven candlesticks, most likely to celebrate the uh, seven celestial lights. And you can look back at the, uh, the story of King Solomon and the testament of King Solomon. The whole damn thing that looks like witchcraft. And this is why it was pulled away from the, um, the biblical collection, because it looks like uh, that Solomon is dealing with demons. And you know what demons are? If you go back to the early um, Hebrew tradition, it's a name for celestial light. <laughs> I mean, this is so weird. So it's been turned into something that is destructive and witchcraft. Read to each demon that um, Solomon binds with his magic ring. He has this ring that looks like it sends out a laser beam because he binds the constellations. He actually binds the demons. And the names given to these groups, I mean, here we go. Tartarus, 
for Taurus, Ornius for Orion, um, the seven Pleiades or the seven fe uh, female demons. I mean, this is so much evidence in the whole damn thing. It's all one big star map. And, of course, it all builds up to what was Solomon's key. There's the cipher. It's a historical document on parchment that Dan Brown said he was going to write about, but he didn't. It's a big, um, let's call it a talisman. It is a, uh, a puzzle, a cipher, that actually puts together, pieces together the whole star map. And I've made a whole website for that one, too, called keosolomon.net. And there's another way to decipher this one as well. It's the same story. Beautiful. Okay. Yeah. I'm Time so for commercial yet? Yeah, right? we're, yeah, we're getting there in a, in a few minutes. All righty. So, uh, Wayne, when it comes to... Uh, Pretty much, have you always had an interest in this topic since you were like a kid, or did it happen, it happen after your near-death experience? I think I've, I've got to be straight with this sort of thing. I never wanted to accept that I might be an abductee or have any intervention with, with the little gray aliens, but there's, there's no way I can steer away from it because um, my dad was an abductee, and he used to speak about them as uh, weird onion-head-looking men as a child, and obviously... You know, there was no books to refer to in this, so he called them onion head men. <laughs> um, onion head. The, uh, yeah, it was strange, you know, teared, drop shed head. Um, and of course, as a child, I, I have um, mainly dreams that keep reoccurring when I was about seven or eight years old, running to the backyard, shouting out to my dad, they're back, they're back, they've come back, and it's big, it like the sun coming down with a lot of uh, rainbow colors, and, and then it stopped. But um, I had an obsession as a child as well with spinning tops, and um, my father used to call me Spin It, because every time I would r take this big, this is like a metal, these, these Chinese-made um, metal tops that hum when you pump them, it's like a little pumper action on top of it, and these things hum and you spin. I used to just stand, just sit there staring at this thing when it was spinning and just mesmerized by it for some weird reason. And, uh, you know, I look back at that now, and I can see there's a lot of things that make sense. But um, in time, I'd, I'd like to go through regression hypnosis and, and get to the bottom of, of the whole story. But I'm quite happy to say at the moment it was just a near-death experience. A shamanistic uh, rebirth of awakening sort of thing. It's funny how uh, tragedy and death and, you know, dealing with your own mortality can definitely uh, spark this stuff. It was definitely the case in my scenario that definitely sparked it, having a, a, a waltz with the Grim Reaper, so to speak. Definitely yeah. will open your eyes up, <laughs> no doubt about it. <laughs> All right, guys, we are uh, got about 30 seconds. 30, 29, 28, <laughs> 22. <laughs> going to take a little 10-minute break. Uh, all that good stuff, do, do a little dance, do some Nazi crank. <laughs> All that fun stuff. Do a little dance, baby. Some Nazi crank. <laughs> what what is your obsession Egyptian with that, book, <laughs> I have some Egyptian Book of the Dead spells I'm going to read when we start up to get my questions going for the second second part. Yeah. Yes. I'm looking right now at verses from the Egyptian Book of the Dead. Oh, they're brilliant. i tell you what. There's, there's no
interested in a radio program that focuses on the deeper aspects of the UFO topic? Would you like to explore the facts and truths of what ufology and UFO research are all about? 
Then, join us here every Saturday evening at 7 p.m. Eastern on the UFO Paranormal Radio Network for Eye to the Sky, the UFO Synopsis, with your host, D. Andrew. To UFO Undercover, Wednesdays at 8 p.m. Eastern, with your host, Joe Montaldo, right here on the Paranormal Radio Network. Are you a fan of the unknown? Do you constantly watch the sky, wondering if there's something out there? Things going bump in the night. This week, radio brings you first into the world of the paranormal with the latest news and interviews with the paranormal elite. With hosts Jordan Klein and Nick Queen, you are sure to be consumed in the world of ghosts, UFOs, cryptozoology, conspiracy theories, and the unknown. So check out Whiskers Radio every Tuesday night, 6 to 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 to 7 Central. And give us a call, 1-866-514-1600. Visit us at www.whispersradio.com. how confusing it must be for 
the followers, generation after generation, when they read the, the uh, recorded text of a sun disk, a disk that shines like a sun, is it not likely on a broad basis, is it not likely they got confused um, after the visitors left? The difference between the sun that they spoke about that they came from, our sun, and this disk that shines like the sun that flies. They even put birds' wings on to teach that this weird thing that's disk-shaped, that's bright like the sun, it makes this light that is radiating from it, it lands that, that they stepped out of. Because remember, they're always speaking of these deities that step out of it and carrying people, entities, spirits, whoever they are. Um, it's very likely they all became very confused much later on because they didn't come back again. And uh, the tradition became confusing. It's as simple as that. That's why they were teaching of it as a disc. Now, there's an um, important part of these utterances that speaks of, of the, uh, the, the Pleiades quite often. And uh, the sacred bull is Taurus. They really knew that it was a bull that was Taurus and that this important star, sunlight star, is, is, is mixing up with the sun disk in the um, interpretation. So what you're reading is, is um, a text that has been written over the last 3,000 years, even 4,000 years, and has become confused for the poor old ancients. And um, it's as simple as that. But there is a mix-up, and there's a new papyrus that I'd like to talk about just now that shows what the disk of Ra looks like and where it landed, and um, that it radiated beautiful colored light. And guess what? It's a freaking UFO, whether you like it or not. It's there. It's on a papyrus. Yeah, I saw that. I saw that on uh, on your YouTube thing you put together, and it's uh, it's actually pretty cool. It's amazing. It's just, you know, this is the smoking gun of Egyptology. This is one that the elite forgot about. This is one that has been. It, it looks like a flower. If you look at it quickly on a papyrus, it's a funerary papyrus. The usual Genesis theme with the sky being a woman and the the man being the earth, the, the two come together, all very nice mythology. But gosh, look what's on the back of the Sphinx. And, and they thought it was some kind of a flower or a fan, because it, the ceremonial fan is something the Egyptians actually modeled on the celestial disk. And uh, it's, they use bird feathers, because if the only thing they had was bright colors in the old days, they could show the kind of colors, and it made a beautiful fan. So... It's quite uh, easy to have missed this little, little bit of evidence, and I'm really happy that they, they didn't hide this one. Yeah, it, I mean, it, the evidence is really there. I mean, I mean, those people, it doesn't really matter from what civilization. I mean, they pretty much, they painted and, and they drew what they saw, and they tried to interpret it, you know, in, in the best way that they could. And that stuff is everywhere. It's on, you know, cavemen. Uh, they, they got little, like, ghost-looking guys with the big black eyes. It's all over the place. You know, it's amazing as well with the, the bird's wing thing. If you take yourself back just, let's say, 2,000 years, time of Christ, just before, whatever you prefer, and try and think how you, have, who have just had an amazing experience with a visitor that came down in a disc, that shone like the sun, and somebody stepped out of it. And this person could also fly. He had some kind of a belt around his waist and it made the noise of running water yet they look like wings but they point forward and you could fly with this damn thing and you're going to go tell your friends and family that you've just seen the thing guess what they're not going to believe you unless you add in bird's feathers because nothing can fly without wings and the teaching mechanism of the bird's wings were added onto that disc and it was very important way of teaching in the old days nobody's going to believe this disc can fly unless you put wings on it and it's a, a pictographic um, call it almost like a, a hieroglyph on its own to teach flight. And uh, you'll ask any theologian today, how did the angels with birds' wings begin? You know, what is the real teaching? And I think any, any theologian with uh, a great pride in his work will tell you it was the teaching mechanism and it's romanticized and it's beautiful and it helps. You, you couldn't have it without it in the old days. But today, maybe we should be looking at it and just call them brightly clad flying beings. And to hear a theologian speak like that is, is quite inspiring. And, and this is what they study. They study all the theology. And uh, th their consensus is that it, there's no real birds with wings and actual feathers. You know, there's probably a lot of stuff, too, that uh, is even more convincing with that type of imagery that, uh, you know, antiquities people in Egypt just have stored oh away. God, they no they don't want it getting out or whatever. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know, that doesn't... There's a lot of stuff in the, yeah, in the base of the Cairo Museum 
uh, Mr. Hawat is not happy to reveal. In fact, that, that whole tomb of Senmut that has the, um, the star map that's showing that the Ra symbol is, is a sun-like star, that, that is under lock and key, and only more recently um, uh, scholars have had a go at trying to figure it out. But, you know, the, the, the consensus is it's some weird religion. That's the best thing to describe it, and uh, they, they, were, they, they fabricated it. So yeah, it, what, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead, dude. Sorry. So basically, to get into the subject of Stargate, I'm curious to what your definition of a Stargate is as far as, uh, I know the star map locations kind of tie into that maybe on some level, but a Stargate, could you describe exactly what that is? Is that like uh, just energy, or is it could extraterrestrials actually come through it, like in sci-fi movies, you could get a bit into uh, Stargate a little bit. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, I think the, the spiritual Stargate is without doubt the sun. The sun is our portal out of here. I think it's quite likely that all, all stars collect, connect with these energy, um, all, almost like electromagnetic um, lines of, of ether. And I've looked at the, um, the layout of the whole universe in that aspect. Even galaxies have the same uh, electromagnetic fields that look like um, streamers that pass out from the, the cores vertically and uh, um, like a, a spindle, like an, ax an axle and a wheel. And the soul passes through these stars like they're nothing because if the soul is indestructible, it's a little piece of God, it, it makes a lot of sense. And um, the Egyptians speak of, you know, passing from one star to the next. My own experience and the near-death experience, I would say that's the only way to describe these bursts of light when you're traveling. Um, so the spiritual uh, journey to a star gate is actually a star. A star is a gate. And um, secondly, if it was a physical thing, um, I think it would be completely different. It wouldn't really be the way that it is in, in the movie Stargate. They have this ring where they walk through and it's a wormhole. I think wormholes most likely can be generated in the way out of atmosphere. I wouldn't think it would be possible to generate a wormhole on, on, the, on the ground level um, because of the amount of energy involved. And um, I would imagine it's a very turmoil, tumultuous thing. But um, it's quite likely these disks travel through wormholes. Now, the whole story of the cosmic serpent is a huge part of my research. And, of course, it's the same cosmic serpent that is around the uh, the, the, the cosmic tree, the, the tree of life. And this thing is, is just a line of, of plasma. It's a, a tube of plasma that uh, one can travel through in the spirit or by the look of it with, with advanced flying disks. They can traverse time and space through these, let's call them energy lines that are in space. So um, the sun is uh, the spiritual stargate, but you can't travel to one of the suns with a, a disk. I mean, you'd have to bypass each time you got to a star to just catch these lines of energy. There's no way anything physical can go to a star. Yeah, I mean, the amount, of, the amount of energy that you would need, you know, to do that would be, you know, something equivalent of a, <laughs> of a sun, you know? Yes. Yeah, yeah. hey, hey, what do you think, uh, what did you, what, what, pretty much what was Stargate called before the movie? Were they called like wormholes, or did you, was there another word for them? And well, the, the Egyptians had the name really as um, pathway, as sun pathways, or something. It is, it's quite a few um, transliterations, but it's, it's it's an Egyptian theme. Um, speaking of the, the spirit traveling through these um, gates, and there were gatekeepers. It was the whole thing. So um, the whole book of the dead, uh, they work it in time through hours. And if you look at the fifth hour, <laughs> that's the most amazing hour of the story, is where um, it shows you Ra in his flying disc, and it's, it's not a boat. <laughs> it's, there's five tombs that show Ra in this big, um, call it an egg if you want, if it's not a disc. It, it's, it's some kind of mechanism. He's inside some, some kind of machine and traveling the cosmos, and it shows what's in the heaven and what's on the ground. And the, what's on the ground is where he has landed on the Sphinx. What's in the heaven is this place with a with pyramids in it, and where the cosmic tree exists. And uh, the Egyptians refer to it as the dead pillar. It was a pillar oh that was around. No it. Way. And this was this was the creation god. It's an amazing story, and it fits uh, the Genesis um, 
creation myth as being this cosmic tree, which is amazing. They're all telling the same story in every different tradition, but we have different tones, different styles, all of the same thing. In the Hindus, they call it Shiva with many arms. Uh, it's a tree. It's a cosmic tree. Yeah, and they just, uh, you know, th and then they started traveling between different, you know, countries and stuff like that, and then they start sharing information, and then it all just kind of, you know, just kind of gets mixed together. But you know what? I reckon that's unlikely because remember they would they were calling their neighbors the unchosen ones. They were they were the lowest of low in every angle. I think it's quite likely they were all visited separately. I don't think there was a passing on tradition, and because it starts right in the foundations, right in the basics, and some of them are, are, are continents apart. And uh, I would say it's quite probable this is all passed down from visitations because all of them had this obsession with gods from the start. So it's a much easier story than passing it from one country to another where they were enemies. So uh, I, I would go with the theory that it was mostly the own interpretation. No, no, no. I'm talking about like travelers later on as, as, as oh, you know, you know, know like all the, yeah, like all the yeah, communities, yeah. like they started trading and stuff like that and shipping oh. and all that stuff. But they, you know, you had people that had their one little you know, things that they worship and stuff like that. It could be just one little tribe, you know, and then they pretty soon they start talking to everyone, and then you start getting this other, basically yeah. a corruption of, you know. Of oh, they evolved. There's no doubt about it. And each, yeah. each um, kingship thought they had to improve on it as well. They just needed to change it, and they were got inspired, you know. <laughs> well, yeah, they had to shape it in what was convenient for them. <laughs> <laughs> What do we have today? We have war being fought yeah. over it. Yeah. I'm yeah. kind of curious. Uh, I know you're talking about Taurus and the different uh, stars and constellations. What do you know about Capricorn? I'm a Capricorn. What is the uh, the the shindig on Capricorn as far as all that's concerned? The twelve um, zodiacs are the constellations that that rise with the sun and the twelve different months. And uh, the Egyptian um, analysis of which uh, themes for the 12 constellations are exactly as they are today. It just shows you how old they are. It's on the uh, Dendara zodiac disc, the Temple of Hathor, and um, all 12 constellations are there. And I think it's quite likely that um, they are basically just recording them as, as those names for those constellations, but... Um, as far as astrology goes, which is a different thing to astronomy, it is the belief um, through tradition, in fact, in every culture, that um, oh the stars no have a great influence on, on life. And the soul being born, er, arriving in, in a child, would have a journey down to uh, its, its destination. And that molds that, that personality. For example, your, uh, your stereotype Capricorn personality a lot of people agree that there's a lot of things that, that seem common in, in, in personality types. It might be just a way to mold the soul. So every human has a different, um, uh, what do you call it, a piece of, of something they can give back to society. It would be terrible if we all wanted to be um, stone masons, uh, what do you call them, uh, masons, or we all wanted to be um, metal workers. You know? <laughs> You've got to have different interests. And I think that's a very neat picking up character traits. And... Uh, they, you can, apparently, they say you can you can read your your probability of what will be good for you each day. Uh, I'm not sure about that, but that's what they believe. Yeah. Um, well, isn't each so astrological sign based on an astronomical sign or like an actual space? You know, did? You know, <laughs> you know, every, every, every constellation was given a weird kind of character. Um, it was the old way of of, of marking out the stars and in lines them or binding they, they gave them uh, animal characters and all kinds of characters to tell a story and uh, easy to remember I suppose an old tradition and this seems to be the old way but um, the 12 zodiac signs are mainly birth signs and uh, reference to the seasons but um, of course there are other other uh, constellations given the most weirdest depictions of hunters and uh, like Orion the hunter you know the Orion hunter is also part of a story He's pointing his arrow and his bow, showing the way to the bull. Not to kill it, but perhaps to show that's the direction of the sacred cosmic bull and something's important there. Um, they tell a story at the same time. 
Well, it's like my Capricorn sign is Pan, and there's like statues of him shagging goats. So I'm, I'm like trying to figure this stuff out. It's a little weird, if you know what I mean. That <laughs> explains yeah. a lot. Explains <laughs> a lot. It's like, hey, what's yeah. going on well, here? <laughs> I've been actually looking at a statue lately online, and they're pretty, pretty erotic. <laughs> yeah, look, in the old days, the, um, the best way of describing a story, especially creation, was very sexual as well. So uh, the Egyptian myth starts with really, really hectic, with um, the, um, the male part being an obelisk on the earth, and that's that phallic uh, worship thing. It's quite an easy way to teach a story as well, and... Uh, I think the ancients were very symbolic of it had to involve that because that's the only way things can be created when it, be, when it comes to humans. And uh, be it gods, be it humans, they, um, they put it in everything. So, um, yeah, there's weird stuff in the old days, and it was just a teaching mechanism of patterns and uh, put animal uh, depictions for constellations. I would say um, that even goes back hundreds of thousands of years, perhaps to our ancestors who came from somewhere else. Hey, talk about the... Uh I wasn't aware that there was a star map actually in a 17,000-year-old cave. Yeah, in there's France. an example of the first star map. Yeah, take uh, the story of Lascaux. Lascaux in France is the the best um, human remains that they found near these caves and in the caves of uh, full modern human uh, skeletons, and they call them Cro-Magnon Man. Um, in the cave is actually two depictions. One. Um, lighting team that shows all the stars filled in the uh, the bull effigy and um, it looks like a man and then on the other side they showed um, more of, of a mythology aspect with, with deities and there's no written word in it so 17,000 years ago it was at a time where people were hunting and gathering had lost the, um, the spoken word if they had advanced beginnings in the earliest history it was at a time when they were living really primitively, and they still had this, this mythology knowledge. And they tried telling the story um, of the star map in two ways, and um, it's there in the cave, and it's the Pleiades, and uh, there's the bird-headed god appears to be uh, showing the way as well with these male parts. <laughs> it wasn't the Ryan's belt, but <laughs> it was the male phallus, according to the um, ancient uh, uh, people of France. So what are the, uh, I'm sure there's other in interpretations of that. What are some of the other interpretations of that that they've... Initially, it was man dead lying on the floor uh, with his, his male parts in a weird-looking way, with a bird head, very unusual, arms outstretched, and it was um, a hunting of a bull, but the, the bull was disemboweled, or the bull had given birth. So they didn't make any sense out of it at all. What about the uh, Stonehenge? I was I was always you know I I thought Stonehenge was essentially built um, for the solstice. Yeah, take the rising of the sun lining up with the causeway uh, in July. I think it is. Uh, what 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 day is it on? The, the summer solstice, of course. Um, it's quite amazing as well that if you look at the rising of the sun star and where the Pleiades are, and look at the um, seven, there's, not, there's more than seven, there's a grouping of, of mounds near Stonehenge that are part of this, this whole design. It has a causeway that's about three degrees different, and it's quite amazing as well that if you line up the Pleiades with that uh, causeway as well, and there's three degrees difference, it almost measures the path of the sun going to constellation, because it's quite a coincidence that the sun, our own sun, passes in front of the Pleiades and this little sun-like star. It's a bit of a debate where they were venerating the old sun-like star being with our sun, where the two come together as being um, an important time, or is it one or the other? That's, it's, it's, a, it's a big question, and uh, in time we're going to get to the bottom of it. Yeah, it's a shame because there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of different sites around that area that are no, that are like no longer there. Um, yeah. And that's they found a whole Avery. city there. They're yeah. digging it up right well, now. Look yeah. at Avery. Yeah, Avery. Avery um, there's, there's a lot of stones missing too. And if you look at Stonehenge from above, it looks like it's actually in post-apocalyptic. The one side is all flattened. I would even go as far as saying that um, a tsunami, very, very ancient tsunami, even 10,000 years ago, might have come from one side and flattened one half of it. Yeah, that's. Uh, 
That's what the uh, Indians called a thunderbird. Uh, their Speaking thunder of uh, tsunamis, I know on the date of December 21st, 2012, that no matter what you think is going to happen or what could happen, uh, I'm of the. I think it's, we should try to stay positive. No matter what, and not add to the doom and gloom of it if that's going to create itself. But I know there is an alignment of the pl of, pl of the planets that happens. I think every 36,000 years or 26,000. I think 36,000. But I know on that day there's definitely an alignment of the planets that only happens like you know, like I just said, 36,000 years. I believe is that true? Yeah. Uh, sure. Look, that's, that's one of the reasons I think the mind chose that, that time to measure their end time because it's a unique way on, on the cosmic calendar. So that's the best time to mark it. But I'm still pretty sure nothing's going to happen even around that month, um, that it's just a general marker for time on a grand long-term basis. And um, yeah. if you take planets in alignment, it, Jupiter and Saturn particularly being with the pull of the gravity of the sun, those three acting together, um, are the big ones that could, could uh, affect ocean uh, movement. But again, we've had them in the past and nothing really happened with those two big ones. It's a good question. You know, we'll, we'll have to wait and see. But um, I'll be very surprised if anything happens around, let's say that whole week um, to a month. I'd be very surprised. You know, I have, I have a lot of problems with the, you know, the, the mind calendar, uh, from my understanding, is that you know, it started with a water event, a really bad disaster. And, you know, it went through and everything. Yeah, and they, uh, their astronomy, uh, from what I've learned, is completely based on Venus, just following Venus around the sky. Okay. Um, I'm not too sure on that. You know, look, they, they would have followed the stars and um, trying to put meaning into a lot of them. But remember, if they started on the same basis, like the, um, the Mayans uh, had. That Pakal flying in his ship uh, to the cosmos, to the, um, the cosmic bird in the sky, uh, Quetzalcoatl. Um, it's still the same sort of thing with, with star gods and trying to be up with the gods. Um, it's quite likely they, uh, they're all following the same sort of story and trying to make sense later on. And each culture, you know, had to thumb suck. You know, they're trying to make sense out of these weird moving stars. Venus, of course, is is the most weirdest star if you're following movement because it goes forward and backwards and all kinds of things. Yeah. So to the to the early astronomers, this was one that was <laughs> was really weird, and uh, they would have associated all kinds of things with it. Yeah, it's hard for me to get behind a lot of this mind stuff because, you know, if a culture was so enlightened and you you know they were they were brilliant people in some ways but you know if a culture is so enlightened that they would you know just sacrifice you know 20,000 people at a time mm. to you know what are they I don't understand uh, yeah, wouldn't, uh, wouldn't, uh, these, wouldn't these people visiting them say no don't do that you know I'm sure I'm absolutely sure in fact you know what I think started this whole thing with about what would happen if these visitors, and, and put yourself in this position today, if you saw a UFO now with a group of friends, would it be an emotional experience? Would you be excited? Would you feel your heart pounding? I think this whole thing, it's in our, in our genes. It is a very exciting event. And for them to leave, for these visitors to visit a civilization and then leave, I'm pretty sure the emotions that followed that were to try and get them to come back. And if they were involved with like a typical grave phenomenon where they were taking children as well, uh, fetuses, and, and for the, the, the greater good of the universe to spread the gene pool across the universe for other human life out in the universe, I, I would say it's quite likely there were also people that were given the option to leave with them if, if they were um, children or I don't know. But I mean, it would have been, it would have been a, a very natural thing that a lot of people would want to go with them. Now, because they've taken people, they think the gods came here to take some people with them. Um, is it likely that they're not going to try and make offerings back to these gods, especially with the, the child thing? It seems to be children being sacrificed in the beginning, um, which makes me think of the great phenomenon that they're taking fetuses, and that would have started off this weird thing that they need to come here to get uh, genetic material. So my question is um, their visitations, I think, caused humanity to go off in a terrible path for this, this sacrificial story 
and they all seemed to do it, and um, they turned so barbaric, and they were doing more harm than good visiting. And there might be some kind of universal law that looks down at this thing as it's so emotionally connected to the story. Each visitation was followed with huge downfalls in, in, in civilization. Um, they started worshipping the visitors, and that wasn't what they wanted. So um, that might be one of the reasons they don't come, because we are totally emotionally unstable with this whole thing. Well, you were talking earlier about the Illuminati and stuff like that. Do you think that there is a universal religion for them that they, like maybe because of all these different star maps and that sort of thing, and they have all this information, do you think there's a different type of religion that they have based on their sure knowledge? That if, yeah, if, if there is a group, because, I mean, we don't know. I mean, I've always said that the I'm, I'm more sort of referencing these um, the highest, most powerful, richest people in the world being the elite. There's no real name for them. They're not Freemasons. They're not. They're, let's call them Illuminati. It's a very good name for the Illuminated Ones. They should be the ones that know about uh, enlightenment, being illuminated, and the Star Map story. And uh, they probably just have kept it with them uh, as a personal uh, prized piece of knowledge and maybe shared with their group um, if there is such a group sharing thing. It's all guesswork for us. We haven't a clue, and we can speculate till the cows come home, but we don't really know. And if, if they have kept it and held on to it, I would say then that's, that's a pretty sad thing, that it's been uh, more manipulation of humanity, not letting us know about all these human equality things. And that's the biggest problem of this thing. Think about it. If all these stories were being told to every different race and religion on this earth, and they were all showing that we all come from the same place, it shows equality. Equality doesn't fit in with warfare. If you need warfare and chaos to go and plunder another country's resources, this whole thing is not in their best interest. And that would explain why it was covered up. But I'm pretty sure there's a high probability that they forgot. It's just simply an old story that is weird and sacred and they've forgotten the whole damn thing. And they've kept it as some weird kind of hocus-pocus secret maybe. So uh, that's, that's one way of looking at it. But you know, one day we'll get to know these things. But for now, all we can do is guess. Yeah, the Vatican's probably got a lot of stuff locked up, too. Oh, yeah. Oh, the whole Vatican's pretty loud. It's the same as Washington, D.C. It's the same stuff pattern. They've got a castle called the uh, Castel San Angelo that is a star-shaped castle in the exit marks the spot. There's Egyptian obelisks that mark the other positions. Rome was chosen for seven hills, seven mounds at the sacred of the seven celestial bodies in the sky. It's so obvious when you look at it from above, and... Uh, as I say, they've forgotten it too. It's, 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 well, unless it's in the Vatican ar archives, we can we can guess on that one too. Do they really know the secret? Are there books there that show the damn thing? Well, one of these days we're going to find out, and I think it's uh, quite a far ahead in the future. It's not going to be pretty soon. Yeah, going back to Egypt. I mean, how do you how do you think the Egyptians moved 600 ton, you know, obelisks and statues and stuff like that? Out in the middle of no, I could see maybe them doing some rigging up some stuff to go down the Nile, but then they they take it out to these temples way out in the middle of nowhere. I mean, was the environment different? Was there actual water back then that they could have? Oh yes, plenty. But the environment was different. The rivers were higher, and that was a green area. The the advanced beginnings of um, of humanity would wouldn't have built these big pyramids in the desert. It would have been a, a green area, which shows it must have been about 10,000 years ago. Um, that's logic just speaking for itself, um, quite likely. Uh, but how do you move one of these supermassive granite blocks? It's like a king's chamber granite blocks inside the pyramid that are cut a 1,000 kilometers up the river. You need to get onto a boat that can handle one of these mega, mega chunks of granite and then it has to be placed into position. And if you look at the block, it has flat sides on it that are laser flat. That means it's flatter than a pane of glass. These are super flat surfaces that, according to tradition, they, they stood there rubbing with, with other blocks of granite and made it flat. Come on, guys, you know? <laughs> yeah, didn't they, have, the, um, <laughs> didn't, they have copper, didn't they have copper tools? Oh, yeah. Oh, you that, it, that, that, copper that, tools and ropes and plenty. yeah. That's like all they use, so... Copper tools, they can only be used for a few, you know, good bangs, and then you got to replace well, it. Well, exactly. Well, no, no, they, you've got to believe in, in, in the granite, rubbing granite theory. That's, that's what they're saying, is that the guys put the, with the chunks of granite in their hand, and they rubbed it and rubbed it and rubbed it till the cows come home. I mean, that is just so far-fetched. I mean, look at some of these statues that are carved out of granite, the beautiful 
um, inlaid granite carving, carving a hieroglyph in granite. You'd be supposed to believe that they had a little piece of granite and rubbed inside those hieroglyphs. I mean, it's just so stupid when you think about it, looking at it from an engineer's perspective. But you know what? Engineers don't like commenting on this because it runs their name through the mud if they go against uh, tradition. So um, nobody wants this stuff. Well, it takes away from Egyptian genius. Yeah. So, so these, you know, uh, these guys, these head of antiquities. What's his name? Uh, Zaire Hawass. Yeah, Zaya. I mean, yeah, I mean, if you start going and saying, uh, you know, they had help from UFOs or or whatever, you know, it takes away from his heritage and stuff like that. He doesn't want that. Yeah. Speaking of heritage, I've got to mention this. Did you know they did the um, the DNA test on Tutankhamun? I heard about that. <laughs> this was a very, very depressing answer for the antiquities department because they believed their whole culture was founded on this, this bloodline, and he was most like a Caucasian. That's quite uh, quite upsetting in some ways and very controversial, but it's quite like it makes sense. Yeah, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> These kings Wait, of the age of I look back again there. <laughs> 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 well, but look at look at the the, um, the statue of Nefertiti. Nefertiti, um, the bust of Nefertiti, was is, is painted. If you, I think it's a paint on the um, on the work that is of salmon, very light pale salmon color, and she has all the um, features of a, a common uh, Caucasian. So um, you know why is it so strange that that the whole bloodline of the kings might have been the same. It's not a bad thing, it's not a good thing, it's not a bad thing, you know, what can you say? It's just that people try and put different cultures in, and attach them, themselves to a culture, and it's, uh, I mean, just for the greater good of the human race, we should all just be looking at it more generally and say they are our ancestors, and uh, no matter what race they were, they were great in the beginnings, and uh, it's quite sad that we've just filled this history full of war and fighting and uh, religious craze, uh, chaos. That's, that's what's happened. Yeah, but nobody really cares anymore. I mean, they, they're like, you know, nobody cares if he's Caucasian. I mean, the the normal guy. The, I mean, just, just regular people walking down the street. They don't care about any of that anymore. Nobody cares about that. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's that's our general sort of uh, Western thinking. But there's there's a lot of people that associate these themselves passionately with um, cultures and that, and it's quite sad because the more one celebrates one's culture, the more one is actually putting flags up in front of them for other cultures. So I think culture celebration should be something personal at home rather than uh, out in the public. And uh, human ways need to change. And if we want to get peace and stability in this world, you know, we need to keep a lot of these things to ourselves. Yeah. So uh, when does the story with this white dude run in Egypt? How did that happen? Did they get any more history on how exactly that took place? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, it's... Uh, <laughs> It's a DNA strand that is 95% probability it's Caucasian. That's, that's what the result was. And that just kind of ties in the obsession that these king bloodlines, kingship bloodlines, they even had wives that were their own lineage just to keep it pure. Um, it's yeah. pretty weird, but you can see now they were trying to, to keep their bloodline as it was. And, and it's quite likely that um, they had treated the poor people of Egypt um, that were enslaved by these kingships. Uh, the people that were the lower class of global work were the, the people that were, of, well, let's say they're from Arabia, I don't know where, but it's, it's a, a bloodline, maybe part of Greece, but these uh, bloodlines and different groups were all fighting amongst each other and trying to compete. So, um, you know, who was who? It doesn't really matter to an average uh, open-minded person, but of course, cultures will associate a lot of um, discomfort to all these new findings. Yeah, I mean, one guy would get in a little bit of power, and then he would kill everybody else around him who had a chance of taking over for him. I was just wondering if there's like some Spartacus going on in Egypt or something to that effect. Yeah, that happened. That kind of yeah. happened everywhere. Well, they were like Egypt was kind of broken up into two big city states, and they fought forever. Yeah, Upper and Lower Egypt were always at war, and um, the Kush Empire was the one to the, um, the, the upper parts of the Nile, and they also had pyramids. And the, you know, the African story is quite powerful as well. They had visitors that visited them. It was the same story. And if you go to Southern Africa, I was quite worried that the um, the, the 
I wouldn't find a perfect African style map. And um, we found one quite recently with um, the Chokwe tribe. It's north of where I am in, in a country called Zambia. They found these wooden tablets with the same star map all um, carved onto the wood and star gods that came down, and it was their ancestors as well that came from the sky. It fits exactly with the beginning of the Olmec tradition. Remember these Olmec faces in huge big boulders? They were African lineage shown as star visitors as well. So um, it's quite wonderful to think that we've got all this equality in the beginning and how it developed into obsessions with each lineage and race trying to make themselves better than the other. And that's what happened in Egypt, I think, and it's uh, typical of, of even parts of today's cultures. You know, we, we're trying to be so proud about ourselves and who we are. We should think of ourselves as humans, but uh, we've got a long way to go before that happens on a grand scale. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, you're speaking of actual evolution, probably. You know, so, uh, oh, go ahead. Uh, one of the things that really have, has really bothered me for a while is that you know, you look at the NASA lines, and, you know, you see what things that look like actual, you know, landing strips, and it looks like in, when they made those, they took away the entire tops of, of a mountain. Yeah. You know, and one, how did they do that? And two, where is all the debris? Where did What did they do with yeah. it? You know? You know what's amazing is we, we have laser technology today that, um, uh, for example, the one that goes in the jumbo jet that can shoot down missiles, etc. That laser, if you can mount it up in a satellite and, and have a, um, a control and you can draw with it on the Earth on, on a big flat desert plateau where the color of the, of the surface is slightly different to what's underneath it. Now, in NASCAR, it's got this um, light uh, ground underneath uh, the, a thin layer of this, this dark coloring and what the laser would do is it just it vaporizes the top and, and, and uh, makes a line it would expose the, the light color underneath it every single pattern in the Nazca Desert looks like it's been drawn by a laser because there's an in and an out it's all done with one line to draw an animal for example take the bird figure there's an easier way to draw it than that but because it's done with, with one line it follows through it has an in and an out uh, line. It's, it's um, done most likely with lasers, and it's probably marking the flora and fauna studied by advanced visitors right in the early beginning to uh, to show their work and the study of uh, what was going on. There's this big flat area, and they could they could actually make a big drawing board, and their message could be seen with telescopes in in different places in different parts of our nearby galaxy. So it's, you know, we th we're thinking we're clever with our telescopes and the Hubble. Imagine the Hubble being built 20 times bigger than it is now with um, computer optical uh, focusing devices that actually take out the shimmer and uh, distortion by stars, gravity, and things like that. They would be able to see clearer and deeper and further and up to the point where we can see on another planet. And that sort of technology is way down in our future. We, uh, we will one day be able to do similar things, and I think these NASCAR lines were that message from those visitors showing the flora and fauna that they were studying. Right. Well, hey, Wayne, we got about seven minutes left. Yeah. And uh, I wanted to ask you, uh, you're, you got a little blurb stating that your, uh, has, your book, has, your actual book, has endured a bunch of sabotage and stuff. Can you uh, get into that a little bit? Sure. Yeah, well, I've got three tons of books that are missing at the moment in the uh, U.S. It was with a, uh, a distributor that now has is, is gone missing. I've had two before that have had weird circumstances that didn't trade the book properly. It actually blocked sales. But now my, my, my distributor has gone missing. So I'm, I'm following a weird path here. And we've had the same thing started off in the U.K., but we are in a situation where it's stable. So there is interference, and I've just got to just keep going with it. And I'm so well established now with the internet, there's nothing to stop. There's nothing left to stop. It's all, it's all out. It's all free. It's all available. So I'm hoping I'm going to you know, be left alone and uh, get on and sell normal books one day. So has anybody said, I mean, has anybody like come to you and said, it's just too controversial or, you know, nothing like that? No, you, yeah, have you been approached by uh, anybody? Well, apart from the two Freemasons that told me, look, you know, you're going to have a lot of interference because you've got the same star pattern that is treasured perhaps by different groups. But more importantly, I get these emails from time to time telling me, we're watching you, you little whatever. 
and uh, that we've done this and we've done that and you know it's just tough tacky if you want to keep going you just keep blocking me so you know that's yeah, it's it's, it's crazy because in this in this field i mean uh, nobody in the mainstream or whatever uh, takes a lot of this serious i mean it's almost impossible you know, to get and talk about your book, and if you and if you do get out in the mainstream, it's just a little fluff piece, you know, or something like that. Yeah, that's the, amazing. I've seen I've seen the interference on on the media side as being something that every media is owned by a super group and has a certain amount of control as as to what goes out. And you'll see the paranormal subject is being really, really cut down in a big way with with mainstream media. And I found as well, they tried to block me the one time when I was doing a big event releasing the key of Solomon, um, that they actually removed my phone number and contact details for the, the, the actual event. So it was a no-go. It, it was a dead story. But they couldn't remove the whole story, otherwise it would have been a big white blank in the newspaper. And I tried following it back, and they just didn't know who had actually got onto the printing press and took off my details of the event. We have this weird stuff all the time. Yeah, I mean, like, like on... Uh uh, like History Channel and stuff like that, those shows about the paranormal and UFOs, they're huge rating. They're huge rating things, you know? But then when you get into newspapers, uh, newspapers hate UFO stories because they, they don't go away. Yeah. They don't think it's... I think it's a time of change. It's, I'm hoping that now that History Channel is doing the Ancient Alien series, that they are getting more and more into revealing it. I'm just hoping that they're going to do it, and um, it's, I'm at the right time now to be promoting it. So if we could go back, to the, the last 10 years have been held to try and get this stuff out. So any moment now, the story is going to be looked at more seriously. And just, um, I had one astronomer that was brave enough to say that this is a probability, and guess what? That guy was gone through the mud. Oh, yeah. The fellow speaking on this now will lose their job, and um, that's just how academia treats others that, that want to speak out on the subject. Yeah. What do you got? Uh, uh, what's the uh, uh, nuclear physicist going around on all the TV shows now? Meet you. Uh, Meet you. I can't say his name. Yeah. Meet you, Taku. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. He's about the only one. You know, he, they they let him talk. <laughs> well, he's a celebrity well, now, but uh, you know. I'd like to query the SETI guy, Seth Shostak, because he ran my story through the mud. He said it was a whole lot of rubbish, and he would never take this historical alien theory seriously, and my, my story was a waste of time. Yeah, that guy's, that, idiot. that guy's an idiot. Yeah, he is. He's, uh, yeah. he, he, I don't know what he's doing. He won't look at other probabilities. You know, these guys believe that, it, uh, that an ET will be sending us a signal saying, hey, Earthlings, shall we are? Whoa. I mean, this is likely we should be looking at the common frequency band and look for noise in every star system that's near us and just try and look at the common signals. No, we don't want to do that. Right. Well, one thing I wanted to ask as we close out, if you could uh, briefly maybe sum it up a little, if possible. Uh, when it comes to an extraterrestrial alien being who's advanced, and do you believe that they help create mankind? Or the uh, energy creating this, and then they like kind of like doctored it a little bit. And I'm kind of curious as to how you feel about the human connection as far as creation is concerned. You know, there's there's different yeah. things like uh, you know we were created as a slave race to harvest gold, yeah. and we rioted yeah. against the uh, whoever the deep in charge. And then, of course, yeah. you have the theory that sometimes I subscribe to, you know, weird bird-headed gods playing Sims Life, and basically we're Sims Life. Where does it fit in as far as creation is concerned in extraterrestrials? Did they create us like as a divine thing to create another race? And, I mean, as far as history is concerned, what do you think about that? In a nutshell, I think it works chronology, uh, chronologically as follows, that we, evolution is real. But would it be such a bad thing if the human race evolved somewhere else and then came and colonized here and actually invaded this planet at the time of poor old Neanderthal 10,000 years ago, around about 17,000 years ago, um, and took over a planet that was available? And um, it's quite likely there's been manipulation with certain DNAs uh, to try and make humans more adaptable, to a world that's very close to its sun. I mean, there's no human being that can handle the radiation of our sun naturally. Even the African race has a huge problem with being in the sun all day. It's just, we, you know, we don't seem to be in tune with the sun and our skeletal structure. It seems as if it's evolved somewhere in a smaller planet 
because we want the less muscle connected and less bone density uh, uh, connected to any Neanderthal, any ape. We were totally alien here. And it's quite likely that, yes, there is an uh, intervention with the human race for enslavement. And um, I think the lucky that the, um, the commonality is that these visitors, the majority of them were, were teachers and were positive. So we just got to hold thumbs that um, you know, we get some kind of uh, visitation where it is shown that these beings are who they are and they're human, and um, we get to see it on na national television. It's not a, it's not a, a Spielberg promotion. This is a real thing. These things exist. Tell you what. So it's basically, instead of Adam and Eve coming from the amoeba, it's uh, the mothership dropped them off, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, take, the Hebrew, take the Hebrew story of Adam and Eve. Adam is human in, in Hebrew. Eve is to, uh, uh, is, the, is to give life, and Cain is to have children. It's an arrival. We're in their likeness and in their form. And we um, came down here as a, uh, a colonization. They go back to the Hebrew words. It's all clear. All and right, Wayne. Yeah, definitely. Well, on that well, note. It's been a pleasure, Wayne. Enjoyed it tremendously. We're closing out now. And thanks for coming to church. Thanks, guys. All right, bye bye. Take yeah. care.
Do you like to ask questions about everything? Would you like to escape from your proverbial box? Just leap out and explore our world in ways you've never imagined? You can have that opportunity. As we grow and expand, new features will be added, allowing you to experience radio programming at a fresh new level. I invite you to join me. November Hansen, host of Voice of the People. Together, we can expand our horizons and peer into multifaceted possibilities. This program will broadcast live Saturday evenings on the Paranormal Radio Network. Hey, hi there. Got your attention? I'm Gia Scott, and I was curious what you were doing from 7 to 9 p.m. Central Time on Tuesdays. See, I host this really interesting little radio program that airs live then, and we bring in all sorts of guests authors, experiencers, and everything in between. It's paranormal and guaranteed to make you go, hmm. My guest list is always up at www.giascott.com and do tune in to the Dawn of Shades from 7 to 9 p.m. on Tuesdays. Hi, this is Rob Simone, and I want to tell you about my brand new show here on the Paranormal Radio Network. Each week, I bring you the most interesting people on the planet, the most in-depth discussions, and the most controversial issues. We'll go where no talk show dares to go. Join me every week for the Rob Simone Talk Show here on the UFO Paranormal Radio Network. Light up your night with The Kevin Smith Show. Hi, this is Kevin Smith. Join me Monday through Friday right here on the Paranormal Radio Network. The Church of Nadis with hosts Jeffrey Richard and Guy Weddle. 10 p.m. Central Saturdays. Opening the gates of the underworld and calling down beings of ancient starlight. Tune in and for the apocalypse on the Paranormal Radio Network. Come to our forum on NavisIncarnate.com. A radio program that looks at the UFO topic from a fresh perspective. Sound interesting? Then join us here on the UFO Paranormal Radio Network every Friday evening at 11 p.m. Eastern, 10 p.m. Central 4 the Joyner Report, hosted by journalist and researcher Angela Joyner. Are you interested in a radio program that focuses on the deeper aspects of the UFO topic? Would you like to explore the facts and truths of what ufology and UFO research are all about? Then, join us here every Saturday evening at 7 p.m. Eastern on the UFO Paranormal Radio Network for Eye to the Sky, the UFO Synopsis, with your host, G. Andrew. Welcome to this week's edition of Through the Keyhole. I'm your host, Karen Dolan, coming to you live from Rochester, New York. Thanks for joining me today on the Paranormal Radio Network. As always, I want to hear from you during the show. If you're listening live, join us on the message board to discuss the program and add your questions and comments. Go to paranormalradionetwork.com and join us on Pal Talk. If you don't have Pal Talk yet, you can download it for free, www.paltalk.com. You can also email me with your questions and comments at kdolan at rochester.rr.com. You can also call into the show toll-free at 1-877-786-0562. I'm not going to take a lot of time to introduce today because we're doing something a little different with the format. I wanted to talk about the upcoming International UFO Congress Convention and Film Festival, which will be held in Laughlin, Nevada from February 23rd until March 1st. So rather than talk to one guest for the whole two hours today, I'm going to be talking with Nicole Irvine, one of the conference organizers, for a half hour. Then two of the conference speakers will be joining us for a half hour each as well. I'll wrap up today's show with a talk with Ted Davis and Oliver Kamensky of the Sci-Fi Channel's new show, UFO Hunters, which, by the way, will be on again this Wednesday evening. So if you didn't get to see it last week, you have one more chance to check it out. So, Nicole, are you here? Can you hear me? I am. Okay, great. 
Nikki, tell us about this year's conference. Uh, this year's conference is different in that we actually now have, um, I think it's going to be the longest conference, UFO conference in history that uh, is being attempted. We're doing eight days, uh, eight full days. We start first thing Saturday morning, no, February only, 23rd. It always has been one of the longest, right? I, I, mean, it's I, been... I think so. I don't know. I think most of them tend to just do, you know, two to four days. I think it's always been pretty long, but um, they uh, they wanted to keep adding to it and make it even longer this year. Um, the film festival has become one of the more popular things, um, and to add a couple more nights to it so we can show more films has been the big thing that Bob has always been wanting to do. And um, we came up with a couple different ideas of maybe doing the film festival separate in uh, the first couple of days, but that didn't quite work out. What we tried to do with this year is we have a we have it set up so that People that have to work and can't take off, you know, a week to come to a conference can still come to a weekend. So we have, you know, a nice weekend package the first two days. People can just come, see, I think there's nine speakers they get to see um, in two days' time frame plus some films. And and uh, so it's it, that's become really popular. And we're really trying to reach out to a younger audience by doing that. So... I'm very excited about that new format that we've added. Um, I don't. I can't think of any other conference that runs a film festival. No, no. But I don't know of one. No, not uh, not one. Uh, There's a lot of film festivals separate and conferences separate. As far as I know, this is the only one that does both. And this year we had 24 films entered in, and we only have enough time for 17 and a half hours and we have about 27 hours total entered so um, Paul Davids has his work cut out for him in trying to decide what films are going to make it and what ones aren't and um, uh, I'm pretty excited about it we've had some really good entries this year I've only watched about half of them but they're really really looking good so well right because you don't have anything else that you need to be doing. No, no. I, you know, it's, it's pretty quiet at home. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just enjoying this nice, mild weather in Colorado. Oh. <laughs> yeah, it is freezing here in Rochester. I was going to say, just, you know, don't. This is don't why I like going to Laughlin. It's all, you know, for two weeks yeah. I get to be in the nice, nice warmer weather, so that's for sure. That's one of the many really nice things about this conference. I, you know, the first time I went, I was just blown away by the whole week-long format. I had time really to spend a lot of time meeting people and chatting with them. You know, it wasn't like where you go in for a one-day or even a weekend conference where you meet people. If you're lucky, you get to shake their hands. Maybe you might sit at the far end of the dinner table from them and get to overhear a little of their talk. But, um, you know, at, at Laughlin, you really get a chance to mingle and really get to know people, which I thought was really fantastic. It is, and we really encourage all of our speakers to stay for the whole week. You know, we we put them up in the hotel, and we want them to stay because we want the attendees to be able to meet them and ask them specific questions, and we try to make as much information available to everyone beforehand, you know, every speaker's website or you know, links to their books so they can read them beforehand. So they already have a list of questions. And the speakers love it, too, because, you know, they'll they'll either be at a table or be walking around. And it's a good networking platform for researchers to meet researchers, for, you know, people that just have tons of questions to meet researchers. And um, I think that's one of, one of the greatest benefits of the format, the way that they designed it and they they did that years ago before I was a part of the organization. So the Wednesday night party is always, you know, it just started out with a meet the speakers and sit at a table and talk to them, and then it just it's gradually rolled into a, a nice relaxing evening where there's not a whole lot going on and, and a lot of just networking and and uh, dancing and, and uh, drinking a little bit and, you know, just meeting new people. I think we've had four people get married because of our event. Have you really? Yeah, oh yeah. 
we actually had one one gentleman that asked his girlfriend to marry him that he met at our conference, and then he arranged it so that at the cocktail party they got married that night. It was oh, pretty wow. fun. Completely surprised her. That was fun. Wow. So, <laughs> so uh, yeah, there's there's lots of people that have, um, you know, they only see each other, you know, once a year. Lots of people have made some great friendships, and this is the one time they connect and. It's kind of fun. And then we have lots of couples that come, and only one of them's interested, and the other one hangs out and plays in the casino the whole week while the other one's up at all the meetings. And, you know, it's, yeah. that's kind yeah. of fun, too. So. UFO conferences are interesting because it is. It, I think it's kind of rare to have many members of a single family who are interested in the topic. It seems like a lot of people who come either come by themselves and, you know, the family stays home or goes and does something different or, yeah. <coughs> excuse me, I've got this cold, or um, they might bring the family along and only one person is interested, which is not yeah. much fun. Yeah, we have uh, we have a lot of people. Actually, this year we have three three people that are bringing their, um, their kids with them that are college age, and... So that's kind of exciting to um, to see some people try to get their kids and interested in it. I know my parents tried to get me interested in this years and years and years ago, and it, it was just not something I was really all that interested in. So, um, you know, now it's it's funny that I'm one of the organizers. Yeah, and your but, family's involved. Yeah. <laughs> My dad's been interested in this for, since he was in his early 20s, so. So how, were they a part of the, the UFO Congress right from the beginning? Um, the very first International UFO Congress was put on by Wendell Stevens uh, back in 1991, and um, he did just a, I, I, I want to say it was a weekend event, but I could be wrong. It could have just been a one-day event. And he was there, and my dad, Bob, was um, just a volunteer. Came down. That was the first time he had met Wendell. And Wendell had done it, and um, together they, after they, the first one was done, together they kind of created um, from that a, a yearly thing that then went from, I think the first few years it was still just a weekend event. And it's, it's gradually evolved, and at some point there we had the two a year we had the summer summer seminars and those were geared for it was also a week long and they were geared for more of the ancient history um topics and um then that kind of the very last one we did was uh right it was two weeks after 9-11 and that was the the last one we did four of them and it's just it takes a lot to put these things on it takes a good six months and it just kind of didn't really work out with the scheduling of everything to be able to put two of them on. So uh, I can only take, imagine how much goes into putting this together. I mean, yeah, me now, too. <laughs> yeah. It's such a long event now, and you have so many speakers. We do. We start back in August. Um, this past August, actually in, in June and July, we started working on what were we going to change with uh, – a lot of our technology, we really want to improve the quality of the AV and the, the quality of the images on the screen. Some people come with a, to this thing and they have some great, amazing footage, but it just didn't really quite look good. So we've, we've put a lot of time and energy. We have a great group of, you know, volunteers that just want to make this so good for everyone. And it's, it was really amazing to me how so soon after last year's event, they were already talking to me about these new things that they wanted to do and wow. how we can make it better, and it's it's really awesome. I mean, there's no way I could do it without these guys. They really they really have the technical side down to a T and, and know what they're doing. So, You've got um, an amazing group of people working. I do. I do. I've, I've been to a couple of the conferences there, and, and I'm always so impressed. I mean, anytime anyone needs anything. There's always, like, as soon as you ask anyone a question, there are four or five people there trying to help, you know, straighten yeah. it out. <laughs> it's just amazing. We are. My mom always called it uh, her dysfunctional family, <laughs> you know. With, and uh, it is amazing. It really is. I I didn't get into it until uh, until 97. 
And before that, I was just, uh, I would stay home and they would go do this thing. And it was, you know, I was in college. It was just part of their life and their livelihood. And and uh, it was really amazing. And the very first time I went, how many people are just there. It's just this big, huge family. It's really neat. And uh, you really want to go. You know, it was, today we were working on stuff and two of my AV guys are in town helping. And they're both just so excited and they're counting down. I'm a little nervous because I have a lot to do in two weeks, but they're all excited and can't wait. So it's good. Everybody likes seeing everybody and and hanging out. And everybody has great experiences that they can talk about that has happened in the past year. And, um, again, the main goal of all these people is they just want this information out there and they want people to be able to have access to it. And they're not forceful. They're not saying that what they believe is 100% and you have to believe it, but they just really want you to listen to them and give them the time to, and respect to hear what they have to say and question it. And if you walk away still not believing what they say, you know, they're not offended by it. It's um, it's pretty amazing. It's really great, too, for people who are interested in UFOs but are surrounded by people who think they're crazy. <laughs> yes, <laughs> It's so nice to go and spend a whole week with people who don't think you're crazy for being curious. Right, right. And for thinking maybe there is something else in the universe besides us. Right. And and then wanting really to find out. I mean, not only do you put, your, put people in touch with others of like mind, but then you put them in touch with people who actually have some of the information they're looking for. Right. That's pretty incredible right there, too. And then experiencers have a place to go and talk. We have the experiencer workshops that are... We do. They're very... I mean, I've never been into one because I'm not allowed because they're very careful to protect the privacy of the experiencers. And I think that's fantastic that, that this is available to people who want to go and talk with someone who knows about this. Yes. I've never been in, in a workshop either for, for the same reason. It's um, I can't... Um, I can't even begin to understand or imagine what they're going through. But, I i mean, it's for a lot of them that I have talked to, it's a very emotional thing. And it's something that's very hard for some people to accept or to understand what happened to them. And everybody has different things that happen on different levels. Mm -hmm. And it's great to just sit around in a room with only, you know, 20 or 30 other people. And they can they can help you. It's almost like a healing session to some level of, well, you know, you should read this book because I had that same situation happen and this is, you know, or you should talk to this person or you should, you know, it's it's nice. It's nice to have people that don't think you're crazy and do understand what you're going through. It's in a very private and emotional thing that happens to these people. And um, so it's something that, you know, some people have pushed us to make a public forum and we just really can't do that. We do it one morning and any experiencer that wants to get up and tell their story in front of everyone, they can. We still don't record it. We'll never record it. We we really want it to still be this private, yeah. small community feel, you know, and yeah. um, I really, I think it's one of the greatest things that they've done. I think that's really the best way to handle it. I mean, to provide these the closed sessions that are very secure and very safe environment for people who who don't really feel comfortable bringing it all out. But then you do give an opportunity for anyone who does feel okay with standing up and, and sharing their experience. 